So I'm delighted to be with you today, even if it's virtually. Um, I'm on the west coast of Canada. Um, and even though my weather is not quite like yours, at least we share the same beautiful Pacific Ocean. So it's my pleasure today to talk to you about um, some of the things that I and my students have been able to do over the years and the things that we've encountered. And particularly, well, this is just a simple uh, start um, to a very complicated deep ocean. On this slide, I have a uh, paper that I suggest you might want to look at just to give you uh, ideas about what, what the habitats and the diversity in the deep sea are like. It's a long paper, but you can flip through it and find bits and pieces. So let's just start in the, the usual kind of way. We're going to start near the surface and go down to the bottom. This presents how we divide up the pelagic zone in the ocean. All the, um, all the production, the plant activity happens in the sunlit layers at the top. This is where the phytoplankton are. And then below that, um, we have areas of the ocean that just have lots and lots of um, biomass in them, animals that are eating the plants and each other. And then as we go down deeper, as we get below 1,000 meters in depth, the light has disappeared and the uh, biomass has gone down, but there still are, is a large amount of organisms, um, fish and fishing activities will reach to these depths. And then we go down into what we call the, the abyssopelagic. It's the biggest realm on our planet, and it's the one about which we know the least. The average ocean floor is about here at about 3,800 meters in depth. That's just the average. So just think about that volume of ocean that's deeper. Now there's not much ocean that's uh, at what we call the hadal depths. This is where we go into the trenches. So let's start going down through and just think about how people used to um, conceive of what the deep sea was life like. And a lot of, a lot of that, um, much of it was true that it's cold. It really is cold down there. And there's not much to eat. Um, and it's really dark. And we have known for quite a long time that there's some strange stuff that lives down there. But then other ideas that life wouldn't be very uh, extensive, that the whole deep sea is quiet, all the same, that it's, it's a desert. This, this we know now is not true. And instead, what we're understanding is that the habitats are really quite diverse. And as a result, the, the habitat diversity is sponsoring adaptations, which means we've got a lot of animal diversity, microbial diversity, little stuff, big stuff. And one of the things that we're learning really is that um, as we delve into the depths, we're understanding so much more about how life is adapted to extreme conditions. So let's just look at the consequences of some of this, um, these, these aspects on the left here. Now, you know that if you are cold and hungry, you'd want to conserve your energy. And indeed, that's what the organisms in the deep sea are doing. Almost all of their food is falling down from the surface, so it makes it hard to get. And if you are a large animal, you do need uh, a fair chunk of food, but you want to conserve. So you, uh, they have low metabolisms, they grow slowly, they move slowly. So if we look at these two um, rat tails up here on the right, <clears throat> the top one lives in shallower zones of the ocean. It's quite active, it gets more food, and it reproduces quite a few times in its life. But its cousin, living down on the abyssal plains, 
moves incredibly slowly. It's very cautious. It only reproduces once in its life. And even the deep water predators, like this Bathysaurus, they lie on the bottom. They don't move much, and then it's the pounce. So here we see a beautiful chimera. This is a fish you'll see in your waters. And look, he's not moving at all, just conserving. This tripods fish sits on the bottom with its modified fins and waiting for food to waft past it. And this sea cucumber hardly looks like it's moving at all. It actually, there's a leg that moves, <laughs> going very, very slowly. So the consequences of this low metabolism is that if there are any small temperature changes in the deep sea, it raises the metabolism and all of a sudden the food needs go up. That's a problem. Where do they get it? So we have slow, old individuals rarely reproducing, such as this Greenland shark to 400 years, doesn't mature until 150 years old. We have tube worms that people think are hundreds of years old. And the fantastic corals in deep water dated at least some of them to 4,000 years of age. So the consequences there are that populations that are damaged will take much, much longer to recover than in shallow water. One of the amazing migrations on our planet happens every day from the deep sea. And this is because the shrimp that live down deep to stay away from predators migrate up to the surface every dusk as the sun is going down to feed on the phytoplankton at the surface. And they're followed by deep water fish, such as this lantern fish, that go up as well to feed. And then the squid come up as well. So they're coming up from depths as deep as a thousand meters in depth up to the surface. They feed and they want to avoid predators that might be able to see them so they go down when the sun comes up. This is really important to those predators that live in the, the upper layers of the water. Whatever they can get at night, this is a big food input. Now, if we go down below that thousand meters, this is a much safer place to be because it is dark. There's practically no light that penetrates from the surface, but there is light. And that is generated by bioluminescence. Uh, we look at it as the realm of fitful start sparks. If you turn off all the lights in your submersible as you go down, all of a sudden, all these lights start popping on and off around you. And this light comes from, uh, comes from animals, from a chemical reaction that releases photons. And why these animals do it? Well, there's some ideas. Um, for example, this is a squid, and um, researchers think it's saying, I need a mate. I need my mate to be able to see me. I'm going to turn on my lights. Look how attractive I am. Others use it to uh, warn off um, predators. It's a defense mechanism. So here we see this jellyfish that is being filmed by the lights of a submersible. And it's to, to this jellyfish, the submersible is prey. If you turn off the lights and look, all of a sudden, this incredible light display. What the jellyfish is doing is trying to attract an even bigger predator to come in and eat whatever is threatening it. This black sea devil, it's actually fairly small, has a light at its tip. Um, there's bacteria in that little light that are producing the photons. And it is luring in prey, which it then consumes with its rather large, nasty teeth. So where is this food? Now, if you are a giant squid, well, it's anything out there that you can get your tentacles on. And in fact, there are many predators in, down in these um, these bathyal depths. Many of them are actually not all that large, but they're 
um, but they have great sensory mechanisms for detecting prey. But if you can just make it out, see this picture up here on the left, on the right, we've got a little animal hanging in the water. And in this picture, there are tiny white dots. That is what we call marine snow. When you go down in the submersible, you look out, and there's just this white stuff falling down from the surface. And these are cells of the dying phytoplankton on the surface. They're bits of broken up animals, and they are very yummy fecal pellets that are falling down from the surface. And all of this provides food for the very small zooplankton, the small critters in the deeps. And these small animals are food for larger animals, and then food for the predators up here. But even these big predators have tiny babies that also need to feed on the very small things. So here we have a um, baby squid, very small, a little larva of an eel, for example. So most of the food, yes, ultimately does come from the sunlight production through photosynthesis and falls down. But one of those new discoveries that is happening in the deep water by microbial biologists is that there are bacteria that can take the carbon dioxide in the water and convert it into organic carbon. And in this case, they do it with chemical energy, not light energy. <clears throat> so food production is possible on a smaller scale in the deep sea. So let's land on the seafloor. And no, it's not a desert. Here it is 4,000 meters. And while we don't see an animal here, we see all these tracks and trails and burrows. And so if you dig into the sediment, there's just an amazing diversity of little animals that are sorting through all of that mud to get any little piece of organic material. And so the mud really matters to these, to these creatures. Those are very small. There are also what I call mud-eating machines, like these three animals are, um, are sea cucumbers, different kinds. And they basically move along, they munch up the sediment, it goes through their gut, and they're removing the organics. This is an animal we encountered um, a few years ago. It's called an acorn worm, a meter in length. And you, it's eating at this end, and you can see the sediment inside its gut here. And there it is, coming out the other end in a big, long trail. And indeed, most of the seafloor goes through the gut of some animal. <clears throat> so if we look now just down all the way into the hadal depths, um, this area of the ocean is really quite small. It's the trenches. One of the interesting things in, uh, in your region is that the horizon deep in the Tongan Trench is the second deepest spot in the ocean, 10,000, nearly 10,900 meters deep. These photographs on the left here uh, were taken by a Japanese submersible team going down into the horizon deep. And yes, indeed, there are sponges, there's sea cucumbers and fish and starfish. The life is not really abundant. Again, food is a problem. As you go down into the Mariana Trench, uh, the deepest known fish was recorded at 8,200 meters. This is a snailfish. And there's a, there's a rod here with bait on it, so it's pulled in the fish to be able to photograph them. And then when they go right down to the bottom of the trench, here's that same bait, and it's, it's attracting big amphipods or sea fleas, one could call them. There's no fish down here. Life is actually quite sparse. The pressure itself is, is a problem as well for uh, for the basic metabolism in many animals. Another place that we see pretty amazing diversity 
is on the sea mounts, the mountains on the bottom of the ocean. And these mountain tops, which may come up from say 4,000 meters up to about 2,000 meters in depth, they tend to have um, water circulating near them that is concentrating organic material. And so you will see um, things like these corals in quite high diversity. Now this video, I hope it's running for you, is in the Phoenix Islands in Kiribati. And the tops of these seamounts have just a, a tremendous diversity, especially associated with the corals, where you see all of these little animals buried into the corals. And fish as well. This amazing assemblage, these are sponges, a whole bunch of different kinds of glass sponges on the top of a seamount, and they're all pointing into the current to be able to catch uh, bacteria as they go past. The surface that these sponges are sitting on is, is actually a crust that's formed on top of the seamount. It's precipitated out of the water, and this is rich in cobalt. It's one of the interests for mining. Now, where you live in the Southwest Pacific, it's a uh, pretty amazing place in the deep ocean because of all the rich habitats around. So seamounts, for example, over here, the Cook Islands region with the seamounts, the abyssal plains in here, the trench that I've already mentioned. And then all the tectonic activity that is creating the hydrothermal vents that are shown in red dots here. As we look going down into the ocean uh, that surrounds you, here are examples of some of the things that we've seen going down through the water. Anemones, sea pens, sea corals again, glass sponge with a little feather star. A few years ago, we saw the back end of this fish um, on the Tongan Ark, and it wasn't until a few years later that I got to see the front end. <laughs> and it's a, it's a goose fish. The fins are modified and it actually waddles along the bottom. Isn't she beautiful? Your tectonic activity also creates some rather spectacular effects. Uh, there's a lot of eruptions that happen under the sea, as you probably know. Those lavas pour out, they'll go down the sides of a seamount forming these, these flows over here, or they can rush out just forming massive plains of basalt on the seafloor. This is a video that was taken about uh, five or six years ago, and you can see this eruption. It's, there's, this is the manipulator arm of a remotely operated vehicle. The lava is pouring out, going down the, the slope, and you've got these, this explosive um, reaction with the gas that's coming out in the white beams here. Now, if that eruption were on land, it would be going way up into the atmosphere. Under the water, it's dampened down. And the other wonderful thing about your waters is, are the, the hydrothermal vents. I've, um, I've had the privilege of being able to work on a couple of sites and then also south on the Tongan Arc. There are also hydrothermal vents in Fiji that will look somewhat similar to what I've shown you here. And all of these vent sites are um, filled with species that, that are new to science. So here on the northern end of the Tongan Arc, the black smokers, are pouring out at about, this is about 1,700 meters in depth. You can see almost a, a flickering here. And it's growing these large chimneys that are called seafloor massive sulfides. And the chimneys are um, covered with big snails and shrimp, as you can see in this photo. Over here in Vanuatu, a field of mussels. And the white things in the background are barnacles. We have a little black smoker here with shrimp on the side of the chimney. 
And these uh, vent fish that are only found at these hydrothermal vents. And here, this field of tube worms. Now, both the tube worms and the mussels have bacteria that are symbiotic inside them, producing the food. And here are a couple of species that were recently described from this region. So the microbial production, again, these microbes are now producing food by chemosynthesis, not photosynthesis. And so the shrimp, you saw the, the grazing on the bacteria. The, bacteria, the barnacles are farming the bacteria. They've got these hairy looking legs sticking out and the white are micro microbes growing, bacteria growing on the legs. And they pull in the legs, they lick off the, the bacteria and put them back out to grow. So here are all those barnacles on a chimney. And over here we see uh, the, the hairy, the snails clustered around. And here's a close up of these hairy snails. They have symbionts in their gills that are making the food. And this uh, on the left is a little flatfish that um, we discovered a few years ago. And these flatfish feed on animals that are feeding on the microbes. So this is a, an amazing place um, where you are, your, uh, your ocean has just got so much in it. And it would be wonderful to hear from you, perhaps things that you've known of or heard about or seen coming from your deep ocean. So thank you very much for listening.